I welcome everyone tonight. I pray that the word of God will not just pass over your shoulder. It will enter your heart, penetrate your life, and do something definite and different in your life in Jesus' name. I pray that the word of the Lord will always be fresh in every life in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight and we bless your name. We thank you for your word, ever new, ever fresh, ever effective, productive in every life. We're asking, Lord, that tonight you reveal the word more to every one of us in Jesus' name. Let you do a definite work of transformation and make us a better Christian, a better minister, a better worker, and a better personality in every area of our lives in Jesus' name. Walk on every heart and lead us in the direction you want us to go. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We're coming to this familiar passage, Romans chapter 12. We're reading from verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, believers, children of God, saved people, members of the family of God, by the mercies of God, the mercy that saved us, the mercy that sanctified us, the mercy that brought us out of darkness, into the light and the mercy that grants us the privilege to be a member of the family of God by the mercies of God I, bese I, I beseech you that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice present your body your hands for the Lord your feet for the Lord your eyes and your ears and your mouth to the Lord your speech faculty your brain your mind your skill that will present your bodies to the Lord a living sacrifice remaining alive and yet being a sacrifice that what you offer to the Lord will not be that the tail end of your life the useless part of your life but everything you offer to the Lord is a sacrifice you endeavor you make the effort that this is what you are going to offer to the Lord and you make, make sure that it remains alive. Sin deadens the soul. And so, if you are sinning, little sin, occasional sin, habitual sin, common sin, denominational sin, there are some denominations, they have peculiarities. Maybe here too we have peculiarities. Things you do that has become accepted in the denomination, but the sin before God and sin makes your sacrifice dead. It says that to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service towards their sacrifice and service and then in verse 2 it says and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that he may prove what is that good acceptable and perfect will of God in verse 9 it tells us let love be without dissimulation your smile, plastic smile, shaking hands, befriending each other, but then everything is superficial and hypocritical. Let the love be the agape love of Christ, a love coming from heaven, a love reaching deep to the soul, a love that has a fountain of the water, of the river, of the life and the love of God flowing out of you without hypocrisy, without deception, without pretense, without insincerity. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor, shun, hate, 
detest that which is evil even the appearance of evil cleave to that which is good and then in verse 10 it says be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love be kindly affectioned one to another husband to wife wife to husband parents to children children to parents leaders to their subordinates followers to the leaders transparent love kindness honesty be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another not be so much in a haste in a hurry that we have to push the person in front of us down trample over him and then move on think about other people their lives their expectations what they love what they cherish what they expect what they want don't just think about what you want i want i need i desire i want to have think about other people be kindly affection to other people with brotherly love in honor preferring one another and then in verse 20 it says in verse 20 therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him hold on before you get to your enemy if your husband hunger feed him if your wife hunger feed her if the co-tenants that you are associated with by habitation, dwelling together. If the hunger, feed him. If the Samaritan hunger, feed him. If the neighbor hunger, feed him. Now, if you have not been able to feed your friends, your associates, the people who are close to you, and the people who trust you the people who lean on you if they are hungry and you overlook them if they are thirsty and you overlook them the people who are members of the same family of god if they are in need and you're indifferent how can you do it to your enemy you do that charity begins at home and then now if you know an enemy a person who declares himself to be an enemy a person who acts and works like an enemy therefore therefore because of the grace of god in you because of the new birth that has taken place because of the new life of the new creature in christ therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him an unbeliever cannot do that a church goer cannot do that a nominal member of deep life who does not have real definite experience of salvation cannot do that an unconverted soul in any church anywhere cannot do that it takes being born again in the real sense that the person you know, the person you identify as your enemy is hungry and then you feed him. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. It will melt him to conviction, conversion, and uh, it will melt him uh, to consecrate his life to the Lord to you. If he could do that to me, that change that happened in him, I want that change in me. And then they are convicted. They confess and then they are converted. In verse 21, it says, Be not overcome of evil. Be not overcome of evil. There are many people who are overcome of evil somebody does evil to them knowingly deliberately intentionally and they say 
he knows what he's doing. He gets angry. That arch of that man, that woman has overcome him, has conquered him. There are people, they claim we're saved, we're sanctified. Evil overcomes them. The actions of other people turn them around. They become like lions. You do that to me, I will. You are overcome of evil. It happens in the boss. Somebody steps to you. Intentionally, unintentionally, it's a deeper life member. Let's test him. And you do that. Ah, you flare up. You get angry. They've got you. You are overcome of evil. In your community, somebody does something. They have studied you over the years. And they know over the years, if you act like this and do like this, you'll get him. So get him angry. Get him down. Pull him down from that holiness platform and bring him down to our level. They know what you do. And if you react, get angry, fight back, retaliate, you overcome. Be not overcome of evil. Let not any man's action take a little chip away from your salvation and from the attitude of a new creature. If you're a new creature, all things are passed away and all things have become new. Don't let them catch you or bring you down or overcome you. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. The Lord give us grace. More grace. Abundant grace. That nothing of the evil world will overcome us anymore in Jesus' name. If you mean to stand straight, keep on standing straight, let not anything that is done from the world bend you or bow you down. If you mean to walk in the path of righteousness and you mean to have a peaceful mind, a joyful heart, a cheerful disposition, keep on that way. Let not evil in your community, evil from any person, turn you around, make you lose your focus, your direction, and the stability, solidity you ought to have as a Christian person. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good I can I will and I must I can I will and I must now we're looking at the message today we're looking actually at the whole chapter Romans chapter 12 and there are three things we're looking at number one sacrifice Number two, sacrilege. Number three, service. Number one, the acceptable living sacrifice. I want to preach, make it a living sacrifice. I want to intercede, pray in the prayer warriors, make it a living sacrifice. I want to evangelize, make it a living sacrifice. I want to edify the church. I want to profit the church. Make it a living sacrifice. Let there be no sin in your life. So that your sacrifice and everything you are doing for the Lord will be a living sacrifice. Number two, the accursed, lifeless sacrilege. There are actually people that think they are rendering service to God and right in the presence of God while they think they are offering what they have to the Lord. They are actually denying the Lord. 
destroying the basis of his sacrifice for us and making the sacrifice the thing they are offering dead abominable unacceptable to god the accursed lifeless sacrilege number three the accepted lively service lively we're not serving and sleeping dozing over the service we're not um, you know doing something for god and we're so lethargic we don't have any feeling our heart our mind everything we're doing is not there we're absent-minded we're thinking of uh, when I get home, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. We are not present at the time of the service. That one is not acceptable, but a lively service. You are alive. Your heart, your mind, everything you have is giving. And you're so active, you forget everything before, everything ahead. You are just at this present moment, you offer that service unto the Lord. That is the accepted, lively sacrifice and service. Number one now, we're looking at number one. Number one is the acceptable living sacrifice. Acceptable living sacrifice. Look at that word sacrifice and write it vertically. S, we're thinking about self-sacrifice unto God. Self- sacrifice unto God. If you're going to offer a sacrifice to the Lord that is acceptable, you have self-sacrifice unto God that you are going to find in Romans chapter 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. The Israelites in the Old Testament, they used to take their animal and draw the animal and bring to the place of sacrifice. And now it says the old covenant is gone. The new covenant is here. Take your body and take your faculty and take everything you have and bring to the altar and nail it at the altar and say, I have offered you unto the Lord offered to the Lord, you cannot offer it to another personality again. It's totally, absolutely, completely offered unto the Lord. And that it should be a living sacrifice, holy. Not a mouth that is telling lies, not a hand that is slapping people, not a mind that is thinking evil, not, a, not legs that are walking to evil, not brain that is thinking how to injure another person, then it's no more holy, but a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's S. Let's look at A, absolute yieldedness to the will of God. You're going to serve God, you will. You must follow Christ to get simony. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. Not my will, but thine be done. It may take sweat of blood. It may take agony. It may take sorrow. It may take you lying at the altar of God and praying unto God, Lord, this is tough. But I'm going to sacrifice. And sacrifice demands absolute yieldedness to the will of God. Look at verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
Do you ever think about the will of God? What's the will of God as to what I do, how I do it, to whom I do it, with what mind, what attitude I do it, was the will of God. It is when we are absolutely yielded, submissive to the will of God as to what and how and how do I do it. It is then we have the absolute perfect will of God. Sacrifice. See? Concentration on the call of God. Concentration on the call of God. We cannot be offering sacrifice, looking here and looking there, thinking of that and thinking of that. We cannot be offering a sacrifice to the Lord and wondering, is this what I should be doing? Is that a better thing? We are concentrating on the call of God upon our lives. Is giving me this talent for this purpose. Is giving me this position for this purpose. And my whole mind is concentrating, focusing on that thing that he wants me to do. Look at this in Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, every man that is among you, I'm not a pastor, every man among you, I'm not an evangelist, every man among you, I'm not a soul winner. Every man among you, I don't have this position. I don't have this calling. I'm not an apostle. I say to every man among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. There are people who think highly about themselves. Um, I should be this. I should be up there this should be happening and because what they expect is not happening they're not looking at their call they're not looking at their duty they're not looking at what they ought to do but don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think but to think soberly think before you come to serve and think soberly how grateful I am that have this privilege. Other people of the same age in the Christian faith, of the same understanding, of the same knowledge, they're not given this opportunity. And I have this opportunity. Think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. It tells us in verse 4. It says in verse 4, for as she have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, why do people compete with other people? What's your calling? What's your gift? What's your skill? What has God brought you here at this time to do? Think of that and think soberly rather than he is doing that. Why not me? He is staying there. Why not me? Uh -uh. All members have not the same office. The hand does not have the same duty, responsibility, calling as the feet, the legs. The eyes do not have the same calling, the same responsibility as the ears. And all members who are here, men and women, do not have the same office. There are people who are trying to bring confusion 
and they say what a man can do a woman can do and they make women pastors over men and women and they make men pastors over men and women we even hear now apostle mrs so and so apostle teacher or teacher mrs so and so evangelist mrs so and so all members have not the same office make it clear distinct definite here is the office of the man here is the office of the woman we do not have the same office identify your office identify your calling identify according to the word of god what you are called for abide there don't let the world dictate to us that because the world has this position then the church must have that position the bible is inspired of god giving from heaven and we live and we stand on the constitution of heaven which is the bible they stand of the constitution normally of the nation which is their constitution which is all right but make a distinction look at verse 5 in verse 5 it says so we being many are one body in christ and every one members one of another then in verse 6 it says in verse 6 having then gives differing gives differing according to the grace that is given to us with the prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith and then in verse 7 or ministry let us wait on our ministry or he that teaches on teaching then in verse 8 it tells us it says in verse 8 or he that exhorteth on exhortation he that giveth let him do it with simplicity and he that ruleth with diligence and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness sacrifice s self-sacrifice and then a absolute yieldedness to the will of god c is concentration on the call of god r is renewal of the mind look at uh, romans chapter 12 verse 2 it says in verse 2 romans chapter 12 reading from verse 2 it says and be not conformed to this world be not conformed to this world be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind renewing of the mind we renew the mind as you come to serve the people of god and you come to serve the church or even the world as we bring the gospel the water of light to them you renew your mind there must be conversion you must have been saved born again and your mind is regenerated and renewed and then your heart your spirit everything you do all that you are there's a renewal it's not the old old lifestyle the old old way of thinking a renewing of the mind only then will you be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then we have I is identification of specific calling. Identification of specific calling. Let the hand identify specifically what it can do, what it should do, what it's called to do. Let the eyes identify specifically what it's to do and what is to see let the ears identify specifically so that there's no confusion so i don't jump into your office you don't jump into my office for example we have 
in our church at the headquarters here the pastor we have the moderator we have the church secretary we have the group pastor we have the district pastor we have the women leaders we have the children church workers everything is clear as to how and where we're to minister now don't bring confusion in your district in your group if anything concerns the group pastor giving the thing that belongs to him the work that, be that belongs to him if anything concerns the woman leader give it to the woman leader no confusion so that everyone identifies the calling and the position that he is and if anything concerns the general superintendent you will go through your group pastor who will get in touch with the pastor with the gs if you're in the state you will get in touch with your state overseer you will not get in touch with the moderator in Lagos because it's moderator everything should be very clear who we relate with and how then there'll be no confusion there should be identification of specific calling let's come back to Romans chapter 12 I'm reading from verse 4 for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office then in verse 5 it says so we being many are one body in Christ everyone and everyone members of one another and then in verse 6 it tells us having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us the calling and the gift of the apostle is different from that of the prophet and the calling of the evangelist is different from that of the pastor and that of the pastor different from that of the teacher and the supportive ministry also is different from the main ministry so there's no confusion it's not like we're just you know walking and running we don't know the track we need to run at or run on we keep to our track and there is the identification if i know my duty and you know your duty and we all know our duty then we'll be able to sacrificially do the work he has given us to do and there'll be no confusion everybody walking in the path and walking in the track and doing what he ought to do as unto the lord and not unto men and then we're able by the grace of god to stand before the lord saying i have done what you have called me to do but if we are always doing what he has called other people to do and we make them useless and redundant and then we are just there you're not going to be rewarded for what you have done which you shouldn't have done i'm going to the next letter now f is faithfulness and focus for fruitfulness faithfulness and focus for fruitfulness in Romans chapter 12 I'm reading from verse 6 Romans chapter 12 reading from verse 6 having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith even prophecy if you are called to prophesy to an individual don't prophesy to the nation that's not your calling if you are called to prophesy to a house fellowship a little group of people don't prophesy to the continent of Africa and say door says the Lord to Africa that's not your calling according to the proportion of faith if you are to prophesy 
or to preach or to proclaim the word unto a young person don't go to the billionaire you don't have a message for that billionaire make your preaching make your proclamation and make your prophecy according to the proportion of faith and according to your calling don't try to control a nation when you are just to control yourself i put my body under don't try to control a whole denomination when you are supposed to control just a house fellowship it will bring confusion and you will not be blessed for that and that kind of self-imposed ministry will not be honored by God faithfulness and focus for fruitfulness the Lord said you have not chosen me but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bear fruit and then that your fruit will remain and that whatsoever you ask of the Lord it will grant unto you look at Romans chapter 12 verse 7 it says in verse 7 of ministry let, let us wait on a ministry or he that teacheth on teaching wait on your specific ministry concentrate on your specific ministry and then he tells us in verse 8 in verse 8 it says of he that exhorteth on exhortation or he that giveth let him do it with simplicity he that ruleth with diligence and he that shows mercy with cheerfulness we're coming now to the next letter that is i industriousness for an incredible in gathering the reason why god has given us the skill and the gift and what we to do is so that we can gather in the harvest of souls and this part of the sacrifice and the reason for the sacrifice and the purpose of the sacrifice is industriousness for an incredible in gathering already we have read that in verses 7 and 8 look at verse 11 now in verse 11 not lot full in business fervent in spirit serving the lord not slothful, industrious, hard working. And you put all your strength, all your mind, everything you've got into that ministry. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. See, there is crucifixion of self for God's glory. Crucifixion of self for God's glory. You know, if self is always popping up, self, 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 I want, I will, I do, I'm here, I'm there, I all the time. Other people, what they are to do, you take it from them, I will do it. Other people, where they are to go sit down, I will go there. Other people, what they are to repair, you know, remove your hand, I will do it. That's self. But when self is crucified, and you know, other people have their responsibilities too. And you allow the other people to do what they ought to do. And self is crucified for the glory of God. The result you are going to find in Romans chapter 12 verse 3. Romans chapter 12 verse 3, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man of you, not to think of himself more highly as he ought to think. You get offended when you are told, sir, that's not your area. Let so and so do it. Why are you offended? Because self has been wounded. But if before that time you allow self to be crucified, and then you say, my brother, that's your place, my sister, that's your place, and then you narrow down, you zero down, you focus on your area. There'll be, no, there'll be no hurt, there'll be no injury, and there'll be no offense. It says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified. I voluntarily. 
I give myself. I know if I'm going to follow Christ, the crucified Christ, then I must voluntarily. Jesus said, I give my life. No man taketh it from me, but I myself, I give myself so I can be the good shepherd that gives his life for the sheep. And that's why my father loves me because I give myself power to lay down and to raise it up again. If we're going to follow Christ, that crucifixion must be apparent i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which i now live the life which i now live that's a continuous kind of living that is a daily kind of living it is not struggling it is not trying to i live that life i am saved I am crucified, I am sanctified. The old Adamic nature is gotten rid of. And that old Adamic nature does not bother you again with carnality or depravity. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then uh, we have e the engagement of our gifts for his commission, for the great commission. We engage the gifts we have for the great commission. And that is all that we do. And we do it for the name of the Lord. Recompense to no man evil for evil. That man that is doing evil, that's part of the creatures. You are to pray to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The man is bad. Preach the gospel to the bad man. The man is sinful. That's why to preach the gospel unto the sinful man. The man is injurious. That's exactly the reason why you are to preach the gospel unto him. Preach the gospel to every creature. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Providing things honest. Water of life. Things honest. Bread of life. Things honest. Gospel things honest the truth of the gospel things honest things that christ has provided for him on the cross of calvary provide things honest in the sight of all men that sacrifice a sacrifice when you think of offering yourself offering your gift offering your talent offering your ministry anything to the lord always think of sacrifice there must be self-sacrifice unto god there must be absolute yieldedness to the will of god there must be concentration to the call of god in your life and there must be renewal you renew yourself every time so that when you come to minister you're not still you're not like old cranky fellow you're not just giving us stale bread and stale drink that is already expired but you renew your mind you identify your specific calling you are faithful and focused for fruitfulness you are industrious so that you can have increasing in gathering and then self is crucified crucifying crucifixion of self for god's glory and engagement of the gifts for the great commission let's come to number two now number two we're looking at the accursed accursed lifeless sacrilege accursed lifeless sacrilege look at romans chapter 2 we're looking at verse 22 romans chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 22 thou that seest a man should not commit adultery does thou commit adultery thou that abhorrest idols does thou commit sacrilege Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou 
commit sacrilege. Now, he's talking about those who think they're instructing other people, they're ministering to other people, they're teaching other people, they're helping other people, they're lifting up other people, they're enlightening other people. Look at it from verse 17, Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 17 now. It tells us in verse 17, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Verse 18, in verse 18, and knowest his will, and approved the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. In verse 19, it says, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind. That's a worker. You are confident. I'm a guide of the blind. A light to them which are in darkness. And then in verse 20, it says, An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. In verse 21, Thou therefore that teachest another, teaches thou not thyself you teach others how to repent have you taught yourself how to repent you teach others as a disciple them how to live a converted life have you spent time teaching yourself how to live that converted life you believe in holiness and you teach holiness sit down have you taught yourself the implication of holiness in the life of a christian man of a christian woman you teach about the rapture and you say the rapture can happen anytime we ought to be ready blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Have you sat down? Have you taught yourself how to be ready for the rapture? Thou therefore, which teaches another, teachest thou thyself that the preachest that a man should not steal. Does thou steal? Do you steal money? Do you steal office? Do you steal position? Do you take the authority that belongs to another and then hold that to yourself? Are you stealing the honor of other people and then you have that to yourself that the teachers a man should not steal? Does thou steal? Verse 22, it says, Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery. Does thou commit adultery? You know, sometimes the illustration I want to make the brother should not bother about the illustration and the sister should not bother about the illustration you know we need to use concrete examples to help the people who are maybe they're doing the same thing or maybe they're about to do the same thing conflict between a pastor and another pastor and the other pastor is saying, hey, pastor, I don't appreciate the way you contact my wife or you won't send me to my wife every time, my wife, my wife, my wife. And there's problem in the home of that brother because the brother is feeling, my wife is not giving me all the attention I need. The attention is on senior pastor so and so. Now, the husband is not accusing that other man for adultery. He's just saying the relationship is too close. He doesn't want it. 
and the wife is saying, uh, what's the matter with you? Why don't you, what's this, what's this? Wife, listen to your husband. The family first, before the church came. The family, an institution of God, before all the other organizations. Your husband says, I don't want this. You knew your husband before you knew that, whatever, overseer, leader, pastor, whatever. And so if your husband says, let this stop, let it stop. That's Christianity. Thou that says a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, does thou commit sacrilege? That's where the word is found. Now sacrilege, let's come back to Romans chapter 12. Now as for sacrilege is self exaltation self-exaltation the one that exalts himself above the word above the bible above the doctrines above preaching above anything self-exaltation where well, it says in Romans chapter chapter 12, uh, reading from verse 2. In Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. And then in verse 3, it tells us in verse 3, it says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Let's sacrifice self. Let there be no self-exaltation. We're told then if there is avenging with bitter vengeance. Avenging with bitter vengeance. There are people who think they are serving the Lord and they're full of revenge. They're full of bitterness and they're full of avenging. That happened and that happened. I'm going to, you know, throw that stone back. Sacrilege. What you think you're serving? In Romans chapter 12 verse 19, they let be, Lord, avenge not yourself Sales. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Avenging with bitter vengeance. And then we come to see that conformity to this world. Conformity to this world. Already we have read in chapter 12 verse 2, and be not conformed unto this world. Be not conformed unto this. You are a pastor. Do not conform the church to the organization in the world. You are a worker. Do not conform your ministry and the people you are ministering to what you see in the world. The world is passing away and the lost thereof. And he that loves the world will pass away with the world. Be not conformed to this world. Are recompensing evil in retaliation recompensing waiting for the time he shot at me and waiting for the time i will shoot him down Re recompensing evil in retaliation in uh, romans chapter 12 verse 17 recompense to no man evil for evil whatever has happened whatever he has done whatever she has done recompense to no man evil for evil i indifference to suffering weeping neighbors were told in romans chapter 12 reading from verse 15 rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them 
that we, if we're following the Lord, we're conscious of the sufferings of other people. And if they're weeping, we weep with them. If they rejoice, we rejoice with them. We're told in Luke chapter 10, in Luke chapter 10, here we're reading what the Lord said in verse 20. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 20, it says, In this rejoice not, because the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice, because your names are reaching in heaven. And while they were rejoicing, look at verse 21, Christ also rejoicing, and it says, Father, in that same hour, Jesus rejoiced rejoiced in the spirit and said i thank thee O father lord of heaven and earth that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto babes even so father for so it seemed good in thy sight but he also wept for the people that wept you remember john chapter 11 verse 35 and Jesus wept. So we're not indifferent if we're following after the word of God. El there is love defiled, defaced with dissimulation. Love defaced and defiled with dissimulation. In Romans chapter 12, verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. If we say we're serving the Lord, and yet our love is full of deceit, deception, hypocrisy, and insincerity, dissimulation, that's part of the sacrilege. And then it tells us, uh, it says in Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 21. Romans chapter 12, sorry, let me go to verse 20. In verse 20, it tells us, therefore, if an enemy hunger, feed him. Don't hunt him down as an enemy, and don't harass him as an enemy. If we do that, that means that we have sacrilege instead of sacrifice. We don't hunt down or us, our enemies in the family of God. And so therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And then we have a good, good repeat with evil. There are those who repay good with evil. You do good unto them, they do evil back. Whatever is sin, whatever they receive, that you've done good to them, you've favored them, you've blessed them, and what they can do in return is to do evil. But the word of God says in verse 9, let love be without dissimulation above that which is evil, cleave to that which is good we don't repeat good with evil then in verse 21 in verse 21 be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good evil overcoming obliterating christian character because of our action the evil we do and the retaliation will manifest. And the bad nature will manifest. We don't show the value and the virtue of the Christian life. Because there is evil, 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 replacing good in small things, in big things, in words of mouth, in action. We allow evil to overcome us rather than good flowing out every time. All that is sacrilege. But now, the service was to render unto God. In point number three now, that's the accepted, lively service. The service that is lively. The service active. The service we render with joy. 
with excitement with self forgetfulness we forget ourselves and we plunge ourselves into the good service of the lord and of the church and even of the world around us the accepted lively service as we look at this again we're looking we're using the letters of that word service number one serving men like serving Christ serving men like serving Christ if Christ what you come to you how would you serve him that's how to serve people around you sometimes those of us who go to school to learn on education how to be a teacher the teacher's theory over some time and after some time they send us for what they call practical teaching and they send us to a school we stand in front of them and we teach them and our lecturer the examiner who wants to see how much we know about teaching is right there and is watching us I will introduce the subject. I will teach the young people seated before us. I will answer their questions. How we position ourselves to make sure that those students get what we are transmitting, transferring onto them. And then he will grade us as to how we teach now bring it home you're teaching in their fellowship and the master teacher christ is there though invisible to you and as you're teaching he watches your introduction he watches your passing across the message he watches your conclusion. He watches your convincing the people there to get closer to God, get on their knees and pray. He watches your attitude. He watches your mindset. How would he judge your service? Yes, you're serving men like you're serving Christ. He says, I beseech you therefore, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And in your ministering, in your service, be not conformed unto this world, verse 2, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Then shall the king say, unto them on his right hand come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world look at verse 35 for i was an hungered and ye gave me meat i was thirsty and ye gave me drink i was a stranger and ye took me in verse 36 naked and ye closed me I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Verse 37, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? Verse 38, When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in or naked and clothed thee 39 or when saw with thee sick or in prison 
and came unto thee verse 40 and the king shall answer and say unto them verily i say unto you in as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren ye have done it unto me we serve men as if we're serving christ in verse 41 then shall he say also unto them on the left hand depart from me he cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels look at verse 45 there then shall he answer and say in a very lesson to you in as much as she did it not to one of the least of these ye did did not unto me so the lord is teaching us that as we serve men as we serve others so we're serving him as serving men like serving christ he employing gifts to evangelize for christ we employ our gifts as if we are evangelizing or anytime we're evangelizing for christ he tells us in verse 6 look at verse 6 of romans chapter 12 having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us whether it be this or this or this let us use those gifts evangelizing for christ john chapter 10 verse 16 in john chapter 10 verse 16 and other sheep i have which are not of this fold them also i must bring and it's the gift he has given you that he wants to use to bring the sheep into the fold and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd are reaping the harvest in love for christ reaping the harvest in love for christ romans 12 verse 9 let love be without dissimulation the love for souls without dissimulation the love for follow-up without dissimulation the love to share the gospel without any defilement that's why it's better for the man the brother following up a new convert a brother and for the sister following up the young converts the sisters and again i want to remind you that's why we established the ministry for women for women to follow up to instruct to help to lead to mature the sisters and for the pastors the men the ministers to minister to the brothers but there are people who like to go to the sisters they are men they want sisters so and so to counsel them and they have this intimate problem with their wives and instead of going to the group pastor going to the pastor or going to the overseer they, have, they prefer to go to a woman I have this and they were telling some internal intimate stories that is sinful that's bad that's evil let the men Follow, follow up on the men let the women follow up on the women let love be without sensuality without laws let love be without dissimulation abhor that which is evil cling to that which is good 
the Lord help us in Jesus' name. And then we vengeance unknown in new creatures in Christ. If you're a new creature, and if you're a believer, and if you're converted, and you have the new nature of Christ in you, and you have the transformed spirit in you, there is such a change of character, a change of behavior, a change of lifestyle. If you used to be the angry lion before you were converted, now things are different, and that vengeance and that retaliation is all gone. Vengeance unknown in new creatures in Christ. In Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. And then in verse 19, it tells us, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Avenge not yourselves. If you have grace, that's easy to obey. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I is identifying with the sufferers and the saints like Christ identified with those who were suffering. In Romans chapter 12, verse 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that do weep. And that's how we're going to minister and render service unto other people and see we can descend as we put up the progress in service, we can descend to men of low esteem like Christ did. We don't uh, pump up ourselves, puff up ourselves, and we don't become proud, but we condescend to men of low estate like Christ did. It tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 16, uh, it says, Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceit. Be not wise in your own conceit. In Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And then in verse 7, he made himself of no reputation, reputation, reputation. My reputation, my honor, my glory, my self-esteem, Christ said, nothing like that. He just wanted to serve people without thinking of, you know, self-exaltation. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And then in verse 8, it says, I'm being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself. That's our calling, to be like Christ. He humbled himself. That's your calling. Have you humbled yourself before the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of the word of God? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The Lord help every one of us in Jesus' name. He a define the whole body of Christ. He a define the whole body of Christ. As God gives us opportunity to reach out, to touch, and transform the lives of others, 
we're not seeing uh, that one is uh, Philistine, so we cannot, you know, draw them near so they can hear the word of God. We use our gifts, we employ our gifts to edify the whole body of Christ. And in whatever way we can reach out to them and stretch out a hand of fellowship to them, we draw them nearer so that we can edify the whole body of Christ. In Romans chapter 12, verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, in the sight of all women. There are men like us. There are men unlike us. There are men whose special appearance because of maybe they, they like to wear beard or they want to put on chain or whatever they don't like us but we're to provide the water of life and the bread of life and the salvation of the lord and the holiness in the kingdom and the doctrine of the word of god any chance we have were to be a blessing to them there are women who are like us they don't wear this they don't paint that they don't burn that they don't wear high heel shoes perhaps maybe they are like you we minister to them there are women who are like who are unlike us all men all women were not so restricted and so confined that we we close every door, lock every door against everybody not like deep and life. We open the door for them. We wear a smile. We show them we appreciate them. We look at the good things in their lives. And some of them are born again. They are real Christian. They are real children of God. But maybe they don't know everything we know and they don't do everything that we do. We love them and show them practical love, acceptance, and right hand of fellowship. And then uh, they get near. They say, I didn't know that before. I didn't see that before. And they begin to see what they've never seen, to hear what they have never heard. That's how we edify the whole body of Christ. And as we show love to them, we're not deceiving them, we're not pretending, we're still who we are while we're stretching forth the hand of fellowship unto them, provide things honest in the sight of all men. And then in Romans chapter 14, reading from verse 19, Romans chapter 14, verse 19, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, not argument, not uh, contradictions. Let us follow after things when we meet people who don't dress like us, who don't appear like us. When we meet people who might speak differently than we speak, who might give their message different from how we give our message, we're not going to start argument, and we're not going to start division there. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things whereby one may edify another. That's her calling. Edify, uplift, encourage, instruct, enlighten, help other people to get from where they are to where they ought to be. And Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers in verse 12 for the perfecting of the saints. We don't isolate from saints who are not perfect. We don't close our door, lock our gate against saints who are not perfect. We tell them to come. We invite them. If there's a way we can do things in such a way that they would like to come, we listen to them and they listen to us. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The whole body want to see how to edify them. 
how to transform them, how to lift them up, how to encourage them, how to enlighten them, how to strengthen them in the faith for the edifying of the body of Christ. When do we stop, verse 13, we don't stop until we all, them and us, they and us, we and them, until we all come in the unity of the faith of the, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The Lord will do it. He'll use you, use me, use us to do it in Jesus' name. Identify your calling. I identify my calling as to walk in the way. And I walk in the way, knowing that hands are different from feet, knowing that eyes are different from ears, but each part does its work, its service sacrificially. And there is no sacrilege. There is no sinful living, but we do it with a holy life, holy intention, holy heart, holy mind. And we all walk in the path of righteousness. Then the work of God will progress. In our hands together, no clash, no contradiction, no conflict, but in unity with one accord, with the mind of Christ, we do what ought to be done. The kingdom of God will expand through us. Sacrifice, living sacrifice, sacrilege, a curse, jettison that, and service, lively service, render that kind of service, and the Lord will bless us together in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Take everything we've learned, everything we've heard, where correction has been made in your life, in your attitude, in your disposition. Let's make sure that we have a right mind towards the Lord. Correct what ought to be corrected. I hope that you take the word of God as if Christ himself has come to speak to you. And then you pray back to him and tell him, O oh Lord, do this new work of grace in my life.